All right, thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you to the 405D group um, with Health and Human Services. And so I am going to turn it directly over to Lisa Joseph. And um, we have Lisa Joseph and Julie Chua um, who are going to be our presenters today. They're going to share more about what their group does as well as the resources they have around cybersecurity. So I will um, turn it over to you, Lisa, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Laura. So hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Joseph, and I am the HHS 405D Program Engagement Lead. So we just want to thank you all for um, joining the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services 405D Program Cybersecurity Web Webinar because today we're going to be introducing you to our program and some free HHS cybersecurity resources that you can use to help protect your organization from a number of cyber threats. So quickly, I'll go through the agenda. We're going to have some opening remarks and introductions, and then we're going to talk about some upcoming 405D events and announcements. Then I'm going to hand it over to Julie Chua, who will go over 405D and our cybersecurity resources, and then we will have some time for questions and closing. So I know that in a few minutes, you're going to learn more about the 405D program, but first, um, some of our upcoming events. In March, the 405D team will be attending the HEMS Global Health Conference in Orlando from March 9th through 13th. So if you've heard of this conference or you're going, be sure to keep a lookout for our booth. We're going to be in the Federal Pavilion and the Cybersecurity um, Command Center. And then also the 405D Post, which is a bi-monthly newsletter that also highlights emerging topics in cybersecurity, will be released on March 12th. So if you'd like to receive that and get on our mailing list, email us at cisa 405 d at hhs.gov, and the email is in the top right corner. And we have Patient Safety Awareness Week, which is March 9th through 13th. So we're going to be using this opportunity to spread awareness that cyber safety is patient safety. So with this, we're going to be doing an awareness campaign that whole week, and we're going to be sending out free cybersecurity awareness materials, and that includes things like crafted emails, posters that you can use in your organization. Um, and they're also really great because they're not fully, they don't have to be used during that week. They can be used all year round, but um, spreading the word that cyber safety is patient safety. And lastly, we on April 15th, we have a 405D Spotlight webinar. So these webinars of ours occur bi-monthly and they highlight new and emerging topics in cybersecurity. And this month we're actually, or April, excuse me, We'll actually be discussing protecting connected medical devices. An invite and details for that webinar will be sent out next month. So again, if you're interested in receiving these invites and any of this information, feel free to email us at the 405 d at hhs.gov and we will put you on our list. So today you all will be hearing from Julie Chua, who is the Director of Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance with division within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Information Security. But Julie is also our 405D federal co-lead, and so we're very excited to have her here to speak with us today about the cybersecurity resources. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Julie. Great, thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you for joining us today for a, an overview of the 405D program as well as introducing you to some of the resources that we are currently producing and are available for your use within your organization. One thing that I'd like to highlight is, I'd like this to be a, an interactive session. If there are questions that come in, please let me know, and I'll try to address them as we go through the presentation. So for today's discussion, there are a few things that I'd like to accomplish. One is to make the audience aware that cybersecurity is a current threat to the healthcare and public health industry. Why are we putting emphasis on this? What is the relevance, no matter what role you are in within a, health, within a healthcare organization? And also the many, or the many, sorry, resources that we have to help you 
um, educate your workforce and also implement some of the cybersecurity practices within the resources that I will be mentioning. So this slide right here is giving you an idea of the current state of cybersecurity within the healthcare and public health sector. A lot of the things that we hear in the news are really providing a visual of cyber safety is patient safety. Because when we hear about ransomware attacks or any other cyber incident, the next thing you hear about is that a hospital has been shut down or a hospital was forced to close or they are forced to divert their care to another hospital which might not be in the vicinity of where they are located, so a much further or farther uh, location. So these are things that HHS is aware of and we acknowledge that it is a reality that cybersecurity incidents could lead to patient safety issues. A few other things on this slide that are worth mentioning is that it is increasing. The records that are exposed, the breaches to healthcare organizations, they are ever increasing and that is why we are emphasizing cyber preparedness and not just reacting to when a cyber attack has already occurred. So next slide, please. So the next two slides you'll see is really honing in on why cyber safety is patient safety. As I mentioned, a single cyber attack has the potential to close and shut down care facilities. And when you think of a rural um, environment where there is only one hospital or, or care facility available within you know, 50 miles or even less than 50 miles, this is definitely something to be aware of and something to be prepared for. Next slide. And cyber hygiene. So we have heard of hand hygiene within our healthcare organization. And we know that washing our hands and sanitizing our hands does help and prevent the spread of germs and the spread of viruses, et cetera. It's similar to cybersecurity where when you hear the term cyber hygiene, it basically means that there are certain cybersecurity practices that are so basic that it does not need to be a technical implementation to be able to protect your organization. And we will go through that in a little bit um, within the practices that I'll be highlighting today. Next slide. So what is 405D? It is a section within the Cybersecurity Act of 2015. So Congress essentially mandated HHS to work with our federal partners as well as our industry stakeholders, which means healthcare organizations like yourselves, trade associations, and other private sector entities to come up with a good set and a consensus-based set of cybersecurity practices, methodologies, and approaches that will help a wide variety and a wide range of healthcare organizations manage the risks um, that are presented from cyber threats. That is essentially what 405D is, and that's why we are called 405D, because of that section within a legislation. Within this slide, you will see the depth and breadth of this effort. And the one key thing to remember is this is a private and public partnership. So this is not just an HHS group who put together this publication and put it out for industry and said, this is what HHS says about these threats and the mitigating practices to these threats. On the other hand, it was a collaborative effort with a task group that was made up of 
healthcare practitioners, your doctors, nurses, home health practitioners, hospital administrators, in addition to your CIOs and your chief information security officers, network administrators, and IT professionals. So with that vast and diverse group of individuals, we were able to come up with what is now called the Health Industry Cybersecurity Practices, Managing Threats and Protecting Patients. That is a publication that is made up of four volumes, and I will get into those volumes in a little bit. But another thing to be aware of is this task group is currently still doing work. So as Lisa mentioned in the beginning, if you are interested in receiving information about the task group itself and contributing to the efforts, we will be able to sign you up for that. If you're interested in the resources that this task group is producing, we can also put you in contact and give you the information to receive those. So I'm gonna pause there to see if there has been any questions that have come in. Laura, okay. have you gotten any questions on your hand, on your side? Uh, no, we have not had any questions come in through the chat, but if anyone would like to voice a question, you can unmute your line um, over on the right-hand side. Perfect. Thank you. Great. So another thing to highlight is this publication is voluntary, so it's not, it is not mandated to be used by healthcare organizations. It is just another resource that is available to you to you. Next slide. Okay, so health industry cybersecurity practices, pick up for short, very apt for our industry. It is made up of four different volumes. There is a main document, two technical volumes, and an appendix of resources and templates. So the main document really focuses on plain language explanation of why cybersecurity is impacting the health sector and why it is important no matter if you are an executive, a healthcare practitioner, hospital administrator, or an actual information security professional trying to mitigate these threats. Why is it important for everyone to come together and take responsibility for protecting your environment and your organization. It also includes the current state of cybersecurity. So it has statistics on um, breaches within our sector. It has statistics on um, the cost of a breach and other information that I think your executives would find helpful or your decision maker makers would find helpful. Another thing to highlight within the main document is it includes a pullout of each of the main threats and the practices that can mitigate those threats. It also includes quick tips for what you can do within your organization to manage these threats. And those pullouts were meant to be printed. You can put it in your workstation, share it within your organization as something to, to have so that it is top of mind and it's visible within your organization to look at. And I'll get into those um, tips in the next few slides. So another thing you see here is what are the main threats that are included in this publication? So the five threats are email phishing, ransomware, loss or theft of equipment or data, insider accidental or intentional data loss, and attacks against connected medical devices. So this was consensus within the task group that these are the main threats that are affecting us today. And this, these are the main threats that continue 
to affect us and concern us within the health sector. So the two technical volumes are stratified for small organizations and medium and large organizations. And the technical volumes really get into the how to implement these cybersecurity practices. And lastly, the appendix, it includes a lot of resources and templates that the task group members have volunteered to share so that industry stakeholders like yourselves can benefit from templates of policies or other resources that, that organizations are using to mitigate their cybersecurity risks. Any questions about this slide or the makeup of the publication itself? I don't see any, Julie. Okay. Next slide. So this slide goes into the 10 practices that specifically were put forth that would mitigate the five threats I just mentioned in the other slide. And it includes the whole a vast variety of very basic cyber hygiene practices. And it gets into email protection system, your access management, um, vulnerability management, incident response. There is a practice on medical device security, and there is also a practice on cybersecurity policies and making sure that you do have them within your organization. A few things to remember with these 10 practices are, they are not ordered in any way. So, when you are within an organization and you're looking at these 10 practices, you should be looking at them within what makes sense to your risk posture today or what makes sense with what you can um, implement within your environment. Another thing that the task group wanted to make sure was clear is this is not the end all be all. This does not mean if you implement these 10 practices the, that you are secure and you've managed your risk 100%. It also includes sub practices within the 10 practices that go within and go into detail regarding how you are able to implement, for example, email protection system through training and awareness or through technical implementation. So each of them have sub, sub practices that you can choose from, and it is essentially a risk-based decision regarding what you can implement within your organization. Next slide. So as I mentioned, if, you, if it helps, you can think of Hiccup as a cookbook. You look at the threats that are being put forth and then you choose, okay, let's say email phishing is one threat that I know my organization is vulnerable to. And I know that that is something that always comes in as a threat and I see it coming in every day. You now look at the Hiccup and choose which of the practices within email phishing is most suitable for you. And this is an example of a phishing quote unquote recipe. You know, you have your basic email protection controls. You have multi-factor authentication. You have your workforce education and training. And then incident response, and then more advanced next generation tooling. The one thing to remember is it's not a one size fits all. So each organization's mitigating practices for a threat will vary and they will not look the same. 
So I think the next slide will help a little bit with the sizing. Okay. So one thing that we hear a lot is, how do I know if I am a small, medium, or large? So within the scope of this Hiccup publication, one item that the past group members wanted to make sure was included is, how do you figure out the size so that you can know to go to the small technical volume or the medium and large technical volume? So there is a page in the main document, page 11, if you are going to look into the HICA publication or you are about to embark in looking into the publication after this webinar. There is a page 11 that has a table and it includes a few attributes that you can check to figure out, am I a small, medium, or large? So let's take this one for an example. There are common attributes regarding if you are health information exchange partners, if you have an IT capability, cybersecurity investment. It includes the size of your organization in terms of physicians, the size in terms of providers, and the number of beds, and then the complexity of your practice or your um, care facility. So for this example, the organization says, oh, I have one or two partners within an exchange. And I have dedicated IT resources and staff, and, but they are limited dedicated security resources and staff. However, I don't have, or I have limited funding. I have about 11 to 50 physicians. I didn't select anything for the number of beds because I am not a, um, a hospital. However, I do have multiple sites. So based on this, they say, I think I'm still a small because I don't have existing and I have limited cybersecurity investments. And with that determination, I would go to the small organization technical volume and start with that. Another thing to remember is the small technical volume was developed and designed to be just for small organizations. The medium and large technical volumes, if you think you are a medium, definitely start with the medium practices before you look into the large practices. If you are, are a large organization, you have to make sure that everything that is indicated in the medium practices are already implemented before you get into the large implementation. Any questions about size determination or technical volume so far? Next slide. So this slide shows quite a few things that we have developed already that leverage the content of the 405D publication. We have awareness materials. For example, we have posters with the five threats and the mitigating practices for each threat. We also have outreach materials such as newsletters where there is a section that highlights a specific practice within the publication and gives you an idea how to navigate that practice and where to find it in the publication itself. And the last one is the recently launched social media. So these are, this is another way, I should say, for stakeholders to get in touch with us or be aware of what's new and other news resources that are put, we are putting out on a regular basis. 
If you are interested in receiving these materials or getting signed up for our social media, we have our um, email address at the end of the presentation. And you can, you can always reach out to us through that. Next slide. Okay, so getting into the five threats now and what you can do about the five threats within the publication. And for these five slides or so, I'll try to give an idea of what you can find and where in the publication and just key takeaways if you just want to take this presentation and share it with your workforce or your colleagues within your organization. So email phishing. I think this is one that we always emphasize because it is the most effective threat vector that exists today. Why is it effective? There's a few reasons. One is because it uses the human nature or the vulnerable human nature that if you see something that is very urgent in your email, you are more likely to click it. If you see something that is um, speaking to your more philanthropist instinct that you are willing to help with something, you will click on something or take action immediately. The more prevalent and relevant today is the coronavirus concern that is permeating um, the public right now. So we are seeing that there are bad actors that are using the coronavirus as a phishing campaign. And essentially you see an email that says, know more about the infections or the new infections in your area, click here. Or click this attachment for updated information from the CDC uh, in terms of protecting yourself from the virus, et cetera. So that is why email phishing is very, very effective. And another thing is it is close to no cost to a bad actor to implement a phishing or an email phishing campaign. So what will you see in the Hiccup publication? One, as I mentioned earlier in the main document, there is a quick tip, a pullout within that main document of phishing quick tips. So you will see there what to ask, when to ask, and who to ask. And for those who are more familiar or are more cyber savvy, it is intuitive. Do you know the sender? Are you checking for grammatical errors? If the URL is spelled correctly? And is there anything else that is suspicious? And first and foremost, that you should not click on any attachment or link. So those are things that you can see or you will see within the Hiccup publication. Another thing you will see is for every threat, there is a mapping within the main document, within that pullout, that goes into where in the technical volume you will find more technical implementation of a cybersecurity practice. So for example, if it says, train staff to recognize suspicious emails and to know where to forward them. Within the technical volume for small organizations, it will lay out what type of phishing or what type of training and awareness um, campaigns you can push out within your organization. Another thing you will see in the publication is real world scenario explanation to what this is and the impact to your organization. So next slide. Ransomware is another threat 
that is within the publication. It is also a threat that we know is very effective and very prevalent within the health sector today. Most of the media and news articles you see about cyber attacks really focuses on ransomware. And again, the reason why this is effective is because usually it uses email phishing as the avenue or the channel to infect organizations with ransomware. So one thing to remember about ransomware is it is a variation of malware. It is called ransomware because the hackers and attackers are gaining control of your data and system and they are holding it hostage until a ransomware is paid, a ransom is paid. That is why it is called ransomware. So again, the biggest mitigating practice is have your workforce trained with email phishing, make sure they are aware not to click on links and to be suspicious of very urgent emails asking for credentials, asking them to click on a, on a link or click on an attachment. A few others for ransomware is having a set defined and documented incident response plan. What we have heard and seen where ransomware victims were successful with mitigating or um, minimizing the impact of ransomware within their organizations is when they had a good solid incident response plan. And that means roles and responsibilities, you know how to operate if you don't have your IT and your EHRs in place because it is being held for ransom and you know how to operate with pen and paper. And you also know if you have backups and you have exercised and know that those backups work when your main systems are uh, pretty much shut down. Any questions regarding ransomware and email phishing so far? Okay, so the next two threats, which is lost or theft of equipment and data, and insider accidental or intentional data loss, they, they are quite interconnected, very related to each other, and the mitigating practices here are being careful with not leaving your laptop or equipment unattended. Having encryption in place, if you have equipment that stores, processes, or uses sensitive data. And do you know who to report if you have lost your um, work phone, work laptop, and know that you should notify your supervisor and your IT security professionals if you have equipment that is stolen or lost. The same with insider accidental or intentional data loss. The one thing that I would emphasize with this other threat is if you have policies in place when you have employees that are no longer employed by your organization or you've terminated employment for certain individuals do you have policies for deactivating their account do you have policies for making sure all their um, organizationally provided equipment has been revoked and has been collected from them those are ways to mitigate these intentional or accidental internal insider data loss. And again, encryption is a good way to mitigate against um, 
uh, unintentional data loss or disclosure of information. The last threat is attacks against connected medical devices. The most important thing that you will see here within the publication is to make sure that you or your IT professionals or your information security professionals are communicating and tied in with the manufacturers of these medical devices. Patching of these medical devices per FDA is very, very nuanced and very specific. So make sure when there are patches that it is verified, tested, and installed based on your communications with the manufacturer and any specific FDA guidance um, specific to, to those patches and those vulnerabilities. And again, as a whole, for the five threats, I wanted to um, reiterate that each threat has a specific pullout within the main document. Each threat has quick tips within that document and a mapping of the practices from the main document to the technical volumes where it goes into the implementation of these um, cybersecurity practices. So I'll stop there if there are any questions. Laura, do you see any in the chat? Uh, no, I do not see any in the chat. If anyone has a question though, um, please feel free to unmute your line and um, ask. Julie? It looks like we do have a question um, asking if we can, where to download copies of the posters to hang and distribute in their facilities. Ah, good question. And Lisa, do you want to yep. field that one? Okay. Yeah, so if you would like copies of our, um, so we right now have copies of our National Cybersecurity Awareness Month campaign. So Again, you can use these all year round. So basically a poster of the five threats. And if you'd like that, just email us at uh, CISA405D at HHS.gov. And this information will be on the last slide as well. And we'll email you the whole package. And that also comes with crafted emails if you want to send your employees and um, downloadable and printable versions of the posters. And, and real quick, sorry, Julie. And that, that same style is what we're doing for Patient Safety Awareness Week. So once you email me and you say you want these, I'll be sure to put you on the list to also receive that in March. Any other questions? Oh, and as part of our feedback loop and making sure we are providing what our stakeholders need, when you receive those posters or resources and you find that, hey, I think this type of other type of resource or poster would help us, we would love that feedback. And this is why we are always engaging with our industry partners is because the only way for us at HHS to be able to know what resonates or what is effective within your organizations is if we hear um, feedback, candid feedback, and what else you would like us to, to do and, and produce. Well, thank you yeah. so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I, I'm sorry, can I add something really quick? So also to view the document, you can see right now there's our website right there. So you can download the document um, on our website and it also gives you some more background into 4 or 5D. And um, again, if you would like to get involved, um, as Julie mentioned, there is our task group as well. So they're also working on new products constantly. So if you're on the tech side and that kind of interests you and you want to get involved, 
in those areas, just send us an email and we'll make sure you get all of the information. Anything else, Julie? Yes, and even if you're not on the tech side, if you are a physician, a nurse, hospital administrator, or any non-IT, non-information security professional, we are in need of that perspective. And this is why the 405D publication itself, um, the first iteration was a success because we had that perspective from healthcare practitioners. Yes, absolutely. That's perfect. Okay, well, Lori, I'll hand it over to you. All right, well, thank you. Thank you both for taking time to talk with us today. And for everyone who's logged in, um, as you move forward and you know share these resources with your team, have these discussions with your team, if there's a topic that you'd like more information about um, or have any questions at all, please let me know. And I'll be happy to reach out um, to these great ladies who spoke with us today. Um, but yes, thank you both for your time. And we will get this also recorded and posted on our blog site and I'll email the recording link out um, to all of our contacts as well. So we'll have that available. So thank you all again and you guys have a great rest of your day.